Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is the first module of part two, and this is the first lecture of that module. Um, module seven talks about the mechanism of inheritance, and we're going to start in the first two lectures by considering the simplest form of cellular inheritance, the division called mitosis. And the framework that we build with this, first, what are the events in mitosis, and then what are the mechanisms that bring them about, will give us a foundation to understand the parallel but more complex events that happen in the more critical sexual cell division called meiosis. So we'll talk here about the role of mitotic cell division, and we'll talk about the events in meiosis, and I'll show you a couple of short movies. So first, a review of some essential terms um, that were first introduced in Module 1. And that is the distinction between a haploid organism and a diploid organism. In a haploid organism, the somatic cells, the body cells, have one set of chromosomes. In a diploid organism, such as ourselves, the somatic cells have two sets of chromosomes. All of our somatic cells have a set of chromosomes that we got from mom and a set from dad. N is the number of chromosomes in one set. For us, N equals 23. And because we're diploid, we say 2N equals 46. 46 to each of the autosomes, and then either two X chromosomes if we're female, or an X chromosome and a Y chromosome if we're male. Now, here's the a simplified drawing of the cell cycle focusing on the chromosomes. So we have here a cell with three chromosomes, and that cell grows. Eventually, it replicates its DNA here in what's called S phase. This is growth. In S phase, it replicates its DNA. And then in the cell division called mitosis, the cell divides into two identical daughter cells, which again can grow, replicate their DNA, and divide again. Now, the term ploidy, as in haploid or diploid, isn't applied to the difference between cells before and after they replicate their DNA or before and after they divide. This cell would be considered as haploid throughout its growth cycle, even though the amounts of DNA change the number of set of functionally different sets of chromosomes don't change. Now, the other very important concept that we need to remember is that of homologous chromosomes. We introduced homology in Module 1. We said things are homologous if they're similar because of shared ancestry. The homologous chromosomes, the chromosomes that we get from mom and from dad, are homologous because they share recent ancestry. And they're extremely similar. They're 99.9% .9 identical. So each chromosome, one that we got from mom, the chromosome one that we got from mom, 99% identical to the chromosome one that you got from dad. And they're identical because they are recently descended from a common ancestor chromosome. That's why we call them homologous. Now, here's a cell undergoing mitosis, and I've drawn the chromosomes, and I'm using these chromosomes to tell you what kind of representation I'm going to be using, especially for the rest of this module when we be talking a lot about chromosomes. Here, I've done what I will continue to do, which is I've represented chromosomes that I want you to see as homologous, as being the same size and the same shape. So these two chromosomes are meant to be seen as homologous. These two chromosomes are also meant to be seen as homologous. These two chromosomes are not homologous. They're drawn with different lengths and different shapes. I've also used color coding to indicate the parentage of the chromosomes. So I've used dark blue for the chromosomes that came from one parent, say dad, and light blue for the chromosomes that came from the other parent, mom. Now, when the cell undergoes mitosis, 
it's critical that the daughter cells inherit exactly the same set of chromosomes that the parent head cell had. Because mitosis is a purely replicative division. The daughter cells are copies of the parent cell. Now, here's a question. Without looking back at the previous slide, how do the pink cells and the blue cells differ? And pick as many of these as you think is correct. So there's two correct answers. First, an answer about ploidy. The blue cells are represented as haploid. The pink cells are represented as diploid. And you can tell that because the blue cells, all the chromosomes look different, different lengths, different shapes. In the pink cells, there's two identically sized and shaped chromosomes here and two more here. So these cells are diploid. These cells are haploid. The other way they differ is the, by the number of chromosomes in a set. The blue Haploid cells have three different chromosomes, so we say n equals 3. The diploid cells, although they have four chromosomes, they're two sets of homologous chromosomes, so here n equals 2. You could say 2n equals 4 if you like to do the arithmetic. Now I'm going to show you a drawing of mitosis that's wrong. And take a few seconds to look at it and go, wait, what's wrong with this picture? This is a picture of mitosis. And, well, what's obviously wrong is that the daughter cells are not identical to each other and they're not identical to the parent cell. One of the daughter cells has only two chromosomes, the other has four, but the parent cell had three chromosomes. Now, here's mitosis drawn done right. In this case, each of the daughter cells has three chromosomes, and they don't just have any old three chromosomes. They have one each of the same chromosomes that were in the parent cell. So where did this mitosis go wrong? And the answer is, it went wrong quite early. It went wrong here, just after the DNA replicated. And what was wrong is that the chromatids, the two copies of the chromosome after the DNA replicated, they came apart as if they were now independent chromosomes. They floated around the cell independently. They attached independently to the spindle fibers. But because the spindle fibers can't tell one chromosome from another, the spindle fibers just grabbed random chromosomes and wound up getting them wrong. In the right diagram, after the DNA replicated, the two DNA molecules called sister chromatids, because they haven't quite graduated to being independent chromosomes yet, stayed together and behaved as if they were a single chromosome up to the point where the spindle fibers attached to them to pull them apart. So we wound up with a pair of spindle fibers attached to each pair of sister chromatids. Then when the spindle fibers pulled the pairs apart, each daughter cell got one of each kind of chromosome. Now I'm going to show you two movies of chromosomes in action. The first is a homemade simulation movie, and the second is a movie of real cells. So here's the homemade simulation movie. Um, this represent the line represents the a cell getting ready to go through mitosis. And the first thing that's going to happen is that the chromosomes are going to replicate. The DNA replicates, so now we've got two copies of each chromosome, and they're staying together. The next thing that's going to happen, you've seen it's just started, is that this coiled structure called a centriole has divided to produce, has replicated to produce two centrioles, and one of them is going to move over to the other side of the cell. 
and it's doing this in preparation to producing the spindle fibers that are going to grow out and attach to the chromosomes. And they're going to attach to the chromosomes at a particular structure called a centromere, which I haven't actually indicated on the chromosomes. So now, here are the spindle fibers growing out, and you see that they've attached one to each from each side to one of the two sister chromatids in the cell, and they've pulled on the chromatids so that they're more or less lined up at the center of the cell. Now, the spindle fibers are going to pull the chromatids apart, and if we continued the movie longer, the cell would have divided into two daughter cells, each with one complete set of chromosomes, just like the parent cell. Now the next movie that I'm going to show you is a movie of real cells undergoing mitosis. These are human cells growing in tissue culture. And I'm going to start the movie, the, oh, I should say a few things about the movie first. The gray blobs that you see, and I'll draw circles around a few, these gray blobs are the nuclei of the cultured cells. You can't really see the cytoplasm at all, but you can see the nuclei because the DNA has been stained with a fluorescent dye. You don't see individual chromosomes because these cells are not in mitosis. They're in this stage of the cell when the cell is growing, the DNA may be replicating, but it's diffusely spread throughout the nucleus. So the whole nucleus just glows a pale gray. Now there's one exception to what I just said, and that's this cell here, which is actually in the process of mitosis. Each of those little glowing blobs is a chromosome, a chromatid, and they're being pulled to the poles of the cell. Now I'm going to start the movie and the first thing you'll see is this cell is going to finish mitosis, this cell is going to go through mitosis, and then you'll see other cells scattered around the field of view going through mitosis. They do it quite quickly in the movie, but that's because this is a very much speeded up time-lapse movie. In reality, mitosis in cultured cells usually takes about an hour to complete. So that cell divided. Here goes the next one. Now watch and you'll see more cells dividing. Now I'm going to mark two places in the cell that you should keep an eye on because interesting things are going to happen. The first is the space containing this cell here, which has just started mitosis. And the second is these two cells here. Now, this cell has started mitosis, but it's not finishing it. And it's still, other cells are beginning mitosis and finishing the job. This cell is still stuck, it hasn't quite figured out what to do with its chromosomes. These cells haven't started trying to divide yet, this cell is getting increasingly frantic in its attempt to sort out its chromosome. Oops, those cells just tried to divide and look at the mess they made. This cell's still struggling. There's another one going to complete it successfully. So these two cells provide examples of the kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, they don't go wrong this often in our bodies. Um, cells in tissue culture are under a lot more stress in many ways than cells in our bodies. But this cell in particular provided a nice example of the cellular checkpoints. If the, chromos if the cell senses that the chromosomes are not lined up correctly and all ready to be separated, it won't let the cell proceed through the completion of cell division. And that's what happened to this cell. I don't know what happened to this cell. So mitosis has really only one task to do, but it does it very well. Its job is to produce two daughter cells with the same genetic information as the parent cell. 
In doing this, it produces all of the somatic cells of our bodies. Everything except our eggs or our sperm are made by mitosis, starting from the diploid cell that arises when the egg that became us was fertilized by the sperm. The key to mitosis's ability to do this is the behavior of the sister chromatids, the two DNA molecules that are produced when the DNA replicates each chromosome. These two DNA molecules stay together after DNA replication, and they stay together until they're pulled apart by the spindle fibers when the cell is finally ready to complete cell division. Coming up next, we're going to see how this happens. We're going to view meiosis, mitosis sorry, as a problem that the cell has to solve, and we're going to see what are the tricks it uses to solve its problems. This will prepare us to then think about how my, meiosis solves more complicated problems using basically the same machinery. I hope to see you there.